So I'm going to hand it over to the panelists to get us started. Great. Thanks, Lindsay. So this is the voice that people can hear, but unfortunately can't see. We've already experienced our first tech glitch um, of the session, but that's cool. We're just going to roll with it. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is Erica uh, joining you live from Hamilton, Ontario. And uh, I think we're all pretty excited to be here today. This, I feel like, has been a conversation um, in, the, in the works for a little bit. Um, Jackie and I have the pleasure of, well, we did have the pleasure of sharing desks at the COH together. And um, I think kind of where this maybe started was we would, you know, when we were together in the office, have some informal chats about our respective work. Jackie working at Upstream Canada and myself um, at first working on Duty to Assist and Youth Reconnect and thought that, you know, since there was lots of alignment, um, across our work, we should collaborate together and find opportunities to work together wherever possible. So, so yeah, so that's kind of where this all came from. Um, so I'm going to be the sort of uh, self-designated moderator, but might jump in every now and then to also share and speak a little bit. Um, however, before we get started, we did uh, want to ask Lindsay to help us with a little bit of participant engagement. So Lindsay's going to pop some polls in every once in a while and some sort of questions in the chat box. We really do want to take this opportunity to make this more of a conversation with you all as much as possible. So I think Lindsay's going to maybe um, start off our first sort of chat question. We're just curious to know what community are you joining us from? We're, we're curious to know where folks are coming from. Um, so yeah, Lindsay, do you want to jump in on that? So the one thing we want to caveat is we're trying to not make this super slidey presentation-y feel. We thought we would make this more of a sort of moderated discussion, just so folks know. Um, and a part of the reason for that is that we're all, I think, still really exploring and learning in this work. And um, so want to kind of make this more of a conversation feel as opposed to us sort of telling you that we're sort of experts in this field and when we're still learning along the way. So, so yeah, so our goal is to make a sort of moderated discussion. We're gonna break it down into four sort of parts um, just to help us be navigated through the conversation. So we'll start off with a really brief uh, topic introduction. So Jackie's just gonna give us sort of broad strokes what the heck is this thing that we're going to be talking about today? Then we'll do sort of a closer look um, into the work through um, Mickey and Jane, through the research work that they're doing with uh, young people in school and their experience of homelessness. Um, and then come back to myself, uh, MJ, Mary Jane, and Jackie to talk a little bit about exploring um, emerging, what we're calling emerging sort of responses uh, to youth homelessness prevention and uh, the role of schools. And then, of course, we want to um, make sure there's time for audience sort of participant questions or, or comments or reflections. We're open to hearing your thoughts. So, um, so that's kind of the plan for today. And we're also just going to jump into another poll here. So I think, Lindsay, you're going to queue up a poll for us. Um, you know, you've got to kind of hear a little bit about our introductions, you know, who we are, what we do. We love to um, do a poll and uh, hear about what sort of what is your role um, in the work that you do. So here's the poll. We'll just take a minute. And we'll take a quick look at the results when they're ready to go. Okay. Oh, so we have a pretty close half and a half almost. Uh, so most folks are joining us from uh, the homelessness system, closely followed by folks in the youth service sector. Um, and then folks that are generally just interested in this topic, that's really great to see. Followed by folks in the education system, that's really great. Uh, especially during these very busy times for folks in the education system that you've squeezed in time to chat with us. And then a, and then a few folks, it looks like, in sort of funding policy planning sectors. That's great. 
I do have one more piece of housekeeping that I have to do, or not housekeeping, but like technical things that you have to do as a moderator, um, which is just give a shout out to what the heck is making the shift. Um, so how we describe it is that making the shift is a youth homelessness social innovation lab with a mandate to contribute to the transformation of how we respond to youth homelessness through research and knowledge mobilization specific to youth homelessness prevention and housing stabilization. Making the Shift Youth Homelessness Social Innovation Lab is co-led by the Canadian Obser Observatory on Homelessness at York University um, and Away Home Canada. So I think we can jump uh, to the next slide, Lindsay, and get into uh, uh, the sort of the topic introduction and thinking about, um, just starting to think about what are we gonna be chatting about today. So I'm gonna look to Jackie, who's gonna chat with us a little bit and Jackie, um, you know, I think we kind of understand the role um, that systems can play in preventing and ending homelessness um, and responding to you know, youth without a home. But why, um, you know, when we think about all the systems, why in particular um, is it that the education sector really matters, you know, when we think about prevention based solutions um, and solutions for young people? So tell us what your thoughts are on that. Well, we're going to get right into it. So the main questions we're addressing in today's discussion and likely the reason why most of you signed up today are why does the education sector matter uh, in addressing youth homelessness and how does this contribute to our thinking around contending with the realities of back to school, uh, especially in the context of COVID-19 and what can we possibly do about it? So this is a good segue into the next slide, uh, which is an introduction into the issue of uh, homelessness. So there are 35,000 Canadians experiencing homelessness on any given night. Uh, this is not widely known. Uh, homelessness seems to be a marginal issue affecting a small number of Canadians. Visible homelessness is what typically, typically comes to mind uh, when people think about homelessness. So perhaps you may consider addicts living on the streets, However, homelessness encompasses hidden homelessness, uh, such as couch surfing, living in cars, being precariously housed. Um, and when we consider that it can also be culturally dependent, such as indigenous homelessness, where we take in con into consideration dislocation from one's land, culture, heritage, people groups, and so on. Um, so this number, 35,000, while it may seem startlingly large, it does not necessarily include everyone experiencing homelessness. So the number could actually be quite a lot higher, uh, particularly in the context of the pandemic with decreasing attention and resources to solutions beyond crisis management. Next slide, please. Startlingly, uh, youth ages 13 to 24 comprise 20% of the homeless population. And, you know, again, perhaps even more because invisible homelessness is difficult to account for and therefore measure. Next slide. At least 40% of people with lived experience of homelessness report that their first experience uh, occurred before age 16. And this can be attributed to numerous structural, systemic, and individual and or relational factors. Uh, so for example, systemic barriers include age limitations on supports. Uh, young people under age 16 are typically restricted from accessing many vital supports other than child welfare. Uh, this is complex and, and it's, it's a highly problematic barrier. As you can imagine, uh, we can easily see as well that it's an equity issue. So for example, 45% of Indigenous youth with lived experience have reported that they first become homeless before age 16. Uh, and for transgender and gender non-binary youth, it's nearly 50%. Next slide, please. So why is this an issue uh, within the scope of education since social services is already doing this work? This is a question we get quite often. Um, youth homelessness is essentially an issue of educational equity uh, and overall well-being for young people. So while the dropout rate in Canada now sits below 9%, for homeless youth, it, um, it's 53%. Of those who dropped out, uh, nearly 75% would like to return to school. 
So as you can likely imagine, unstable home lives, housing instability, and or homelessness poses immense barriers to successful educational experiences, opportunities, and trajectories. These young people face challenges with school engagement, uh, and they're far more likely to be victims of bullying as well. School disengagement likely starts long before dropout. Uh, and because schools are the only public institution in Canada where until age 16, young people are legally required to engage, it can be an optimal place for risk identification and uh, intervention. Next slide. The major indicators of risk, uh, for example, unstable and unsafe home lives, mental health and addictions issues, poverty, child welfare, justice involvement, and a complex, you know, intersection of, of one or more of these factors, they're not always known. Uh, students may be exhibiting signs of trouble or not uh, until the risk becomes a crisis. Um, so educators will have said that they, they typically know when there is a problem, but um, they're also many times are not um, obvious signs of trouble until dropout or crisis. Uh, so there might be numerous reasons why youth don't seek out help, whether it's for fear of child welfare involvement, uh, implicating family members or social stigma, all of the above. Uh, the most effective way to address this is through accessible and discreet upstream interventions and supporting youth before they become entrenched into a life of homelessness. Uh, there is growing recognition that this requires genuine cross-sector collaboration from the social services and education sectors and supporting these youth uh, aligns with the major educational priority areas towards equity. Uh, next, we have Jane and Mickey to discuss their fantastic work uh, to understand and illuminate these issues in the context of schools. Over that's to you. Great. I'm um, just going to jump in and say, Jackie, that's a really great sort of 30,000 view of the topic um, and a super nice um, way to capture all the many intersecting issues. I feel like we could have done a 16 hour webinar to chat about this all through. So, but yeah, we were pretty excited to have. Um, had an aha moment when we thought, you know, who's like doing this work is Jane. Let's reach out and, and pull Jane into this conversation. So we're pretty excited, Jane, um, to have you kind of now hone in a little more specifically with the work that you're doing um, and with young people, the work that you're doing as well. Before we do that, we have another poll for everyone. Um, we're curious to kind of gauge folks' familiarity um, and sort of understanding of what is the education sector's role in youth homelessness. So I'm not sure, Lindsay, if you want to pop in the next poll. There we go. And we'll just take another minute. Okay. Oh, look at that. So majority of folks feel that it's really important um, and necessary. That's awesome. That's great. And some are saying it's somewhat important and necessary. Great. Well, we'll dive into this topic a little bit more and learn why it's important and necessary. So uh, Jane, just to kind of, kind of give a little introduction, you're doing this great research revealing sort of the lived experiences of students um, who are at risk of or who have lost their housing while they're still sort of in the education sector. So we're interested just broadly to know a few things. One is obviously what you've been learning about because you're still kind of in the throes, I think, of your work. Um, and, you know, specifically to learn about, you know, what are the, uh, the barriers that maybe students uh, or young people have talked about um, and maybe what are some solutions or what are some emerging responses that you're seeing? So uh, tell us all about what you're up to. Okay. Um... <laughs> I am also joined by one of my co-researchers today, I think. Mickey, are you around? Maybe. You may need to unmute yourself. And Lindsay, also, can we just move to the next slide? Am I still unmute? Am I still muted? You are not. Yay, Mickey. Oh, yeah. 
Welcome. Um, yeah, thank you so much for having us to talk about our research. Um, Nikki actually recently during COVID moved away from Montreal to Ontario. So this is a kind of nice reunion for us to get together and talk about research. Um, yeah, next slide. So everything also that Jacqueline was saying, um, I think is really resonant in our, our research. There are things that we're seeing when people are describing their lived experiences in schools. And there are also reasons why we have gone into this research in the first place, knowing um, for us that schools are a site where we think a lot of, of work can be done in terms of prevention and intervention. So I'll give a bit of an overview of our team and Mickey, I'll ask you to jump in sometimes as well. Um, we're two members of YAR, uh, which is Youth Action Research Revolution Team. Um, so it's Laurent, Shiana, Maxim, Mickey and me, and then Dr. Naomi Nichols, who um, is my PhD supervisor. And this is also um, part of my doctoral work. Uh, in our project, we look at schools. My PhD research really focuses on schools, but we also look at child welfare, um, health and mental health services and the criminal justice system and policing. So our project has, with this in mind of thinking of these institutions as sites of prevention, um, we've been thinking about young people's experiences, um, not only when they experience homelessness for the first time, but looking at their institutional histories. So I'm going to talk today, we're going to talk today about schools um, and what young people are describing when they're talking about their institutional histories in schools. The research is also um, very participatory and, as you said, uh, Erica, very based within lived experience. Out of six of the team members, five of us have lived experience of homelessness. Um, our experiences look quite different, but we all have the shared experience going into it of knowing um, what homelessness looks like for us and housing precarity, as well as what educational disengagement has looked like for us in our experiences. Um, and Mickey, do you maybe want to talk about uh, the way that the interview structure was developed with the team? Sure. So we started off doing group meetings, the six of us, and we kind of decided that we wanted to do it over a period of three interviews because often you can't get everything out the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, so each interview was roughly about an hour long. Pardon me, I'm just grabbing a glass of water. Good idea. Yeah, sorry. So that's what I was saying. So each interview was a, is about an hour long, and we kind of let the youth lead the interviews. Like we have questions and things we're looking for, but it's not it's not like a job interview, you know, where someone just sits there and bombards you with questions. We kind of just let them talk. I don't, I guess that would be like the nice way to explain it from my perspective. I don't know, Jane, if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, I think that's great. I think like a huge part of our project that I just want to emphasize is that um, we didn't want this to be research for the sake of research. We really wanted it to be um, kind of relationship building in itself. So um, also really focusing on the institutions rather than people's lives. So trying to figure out together, how are these institutions working? What policies are at play? What processes are happening? Um, and how are young people understanding that? So maybe the next slide. Um, we entered this research also, I think it's important to emphasize, in partnership with a, a youth-serving organization here in Montreal. So Dans la Rue, um, uh, their executive director and one of their staff members approached me when they heard that I wanted to do prevention work in schools and were saying, like, this is something we're really interested in. And so the first phase of our research, we were really thinking of, like, what kind of research could serve an organization in order to serve youth better. So this research was not only designed with youth and people with lived experience, but it was designed to serve an organization that um, also has a school within it, um, also works um, with young people around educational engagement. Um, and yeah, maybe next slide. I forget what's on my slides, as always. Um, yeah, so we are now in analysis phase. So these are like the beginnings of thought and things that we're finding in the research. Um, I'm sure that that will develop. We did qualitative interviews, as Mickey said, up to three interviews with each young person because we all found, um, because of the extent of young people's institutional um, experiences as people who are experiencing homelessness, an hour-long interview uh, was just so much to 
cover everything, especially since um, what we were doing was saying, you know, what was your first memory of school? And then bring me all the way um, to recently or to, you know, your last experience with a schooling institution or, or learning. So we really split it up into three interviews whenever we could to build a relationship and to really get at what was really going on in school. Um, so we have 57 interviews in both French and English um, with 40 youth. Uh, and recruitment was mostly done at the day center, but we also had folks recruit within their network. So people who weren't using services were also included. Mickey, do you have anything to add on like the, that part of the research? Do you think there's anything I'm missing? I feel like you're explaining it be better than I could. Um, I, I would like to add that definitely us being able to, to use our own personal networks. Um, a lot of us are still in some way involved with like kind of directly in our lives. It was very useful and very helpful, I found. Mm -hmm. It's actually, yeah, so that, yeah, yeah, just, yeah just that. Totally. I don't think we would have been able to do this research without that. Um, and so going into March-ish, we were planning on doing a share back with educators, um, intervention workers, and kind of professionals to see like, this is what we're finding from youth experiences. What are your experiences working in schools or working in a youth serving organization? We weren't able to move into that phase because of COVID, um, but we're still hoping to do it in some capacity soon. Um, and so I really want to focus on the things that we were hearing from young people about what they were experiencing in schools and also state that um, for me, this research came out of um, a desire to think about prevention and intervention happening before young people became homeless, but also because I was kicked out of school when I was homeless when I was 16. And speaking with young people today, I was realizing that schools hadn't really shifted very much in their responses around homelessness. So I wanted to see, um, you know, how things were similar and how things may have shifted from when I was a homeless teenager um, to now. So Mickey, do you want to start this one? Like, what are the things that you were hearing from young people? What are the main themes that were coming out of research uh, around like challenges, maybe? Sure, sorry, for the delay, I, I had to hit the, un the unmute button. So I was finding, per at least personally in my own discussions, with youth that like you I was hearing a lot of the same issues I had like I'm not that much older than a lot of the people like that we interviewed but I am a little bit and it's the consistent problems I was seeing at least our schools are very naturally it seems not gauged to support youth they're kind of just there to pump information into youth um, I, lots of problems with uh, bullying by teachers and students um, you know, not going to school fed, not going to school with any kind of real sleep, um, things like uh, teachers not being like supportive of, of the fact that oftentimes youth on the street or youth precariously housed aren't going to be able to keep up with all the demands of the curriculum. Like from my own personal experience, it was always a huge frustration anytime a school project came up because I don't, I didn't own a computer. I didn't, I didn't have a library card. I didn't, I didn't have a full night's sleep, god damn it. Um, yeah, Jane, do you want to take it over? I'm starting to, to rile myself up a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, maybe, can we move to the next slide, too? Um, thank you. So, uh, yeah, I think that these are all things, um, and I would also say that the way that things are often perceived by students, I think are perceived very differently by educators. So we had a long conversation with like Dr. Nichols, Naomi, about how as someone who was teaching, if she was seeing someone come into their class and like fall asleep and not listen, she might just see that as like not caring, not engaging and all of these things. Whereas when we were talking about our experiences, you know, sometimes you hadn't slept and you were showing up and you were falling asleep on your desk and it wasn't because you weren't engaged and maybe it wasn't anything to do with what was being taught. Um, so what, one of the things that we are seeing also is that, um, like many institutions, uh, there's kind of already a lack of trust around um, like institutional processes. There's a lack of trust around um, relying on schools as a, as a site of support. Um, and that often this lack of trust is also like intergenerational lack of trust, um, particularly for low-income families and families uh, who are Black or Indigenous, where we're say, youth were saying like, my parents didn't really want to go to the school um, to advocate for me in any way, and that schools were just seen as like a shitty place. 
Um, this happened a lot. And then when we started asking more questions, it became more evident why that was. So um, I would say that there was also like a lack of appropriate supports in the schools that people were talking about. Like there might be supports for some students, but that those supports weren't targeted at homeless students because um, schools weren't imagining that they had homeless students in their classes often, especially in primary schools. Um, so a lack of appropriate supports and a lack of understanding of what homelessness might look like, as Jackie was saying earlier, you know, a lot of people have an idea of who is homeless and what homelessness looks like, and that doesn't look like what their students might be experiencing. Um, I think that that's shifting a bit, but that was definitely coming up in our research. Um, also, I'd say, and I think Mickey, you've seen this too, uh, there's like a direct acknowledgement that maybe teachers do want to help and maybe they're trying, but uh, they're so over capacity, their classrooms are over capacity, they're under resourced, um, schools might not have the resources. So like the idea of um, intervening or taking the time or finding the time to directly support a young person who might be struggling in a way that they might not be equipped to deal with was seen also as like a barrier. Um, and, and young people often really recognize that and said, I didn't want to put more on my teacher who is doing so much already. So I, I just like, hit it or I didn't I didn't say anything because I didn't want to be a burden. Um, and then another thing that I would add is that I there's an expectation within schools, I think particularly schools especially, that parents will be there and will be advocating for their students um, in particular ways. And for a lot of these students that wasn't happening for a number of reasons, um, including like that institutional distress that I was talking about, but also like death of family members, family illness, uh, poverty and hectic work schedules where parents just couldn't, um, linguistic barriers, and also feelings of stigma and discrimination. So, um, and also, as Mickey said, bullying was a huge thing, as Jackie mentioned too. Um, yeah, bullying came up again and again as something that, you know, students talked about like a harm reduction approach to going to school. Uh, like, I hate it so much. If I could just go every now and then and still stay engaged, then that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do the bare minimum. Um, anything else, like Nikki, you wanted to add, even from your own experiences in schools? You can get riled up uh, if you want. <laughs> it's time to talk revolution, is it? Um, I guess we talk, uh, you talked about how often teachers want to help, but they don't. And um, this kind of makes me think of the teachers and staff in my high school that did help out. It always kind of seems that it's the rebels who are willing to take the lead, and I would definitely say that a lot of the the teachers and guidance counselors I did interact with who did a lot for me were those rebel people. And so I guess a lot of focus, at least in a lot of the personal work I'm doing right now, is to try and encourage people to hey, move, move outside of what of what the paperwork says, if you would. Like like I feel that schools need to be a place of emotion. It's it's an emotional thing to raise somebody. And I think we often forget that this is what schools are really doing. They, they, are, they are creating the next generation just as much as parents are. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's come up a lot too of like, actually maybe this is a perfect segue into the next slide. Maybe. Um, so this came from one of the interviews we did where someone was actually talking about that. They, had been in a school where it was really, they described it as violent, um, and they moved into this other school. Um, they had become homeless uh, because of some family things. And uh, so they were saying, with this new school, that that school probably saved me in a sense because it was super open. If you did drugs, they wouldn't friggin' punish you for it. They would talk to you about it for the most part. They would help you before they would punish you, you know? And I think this was something that came up, um, was these moments like, where when we were asking what might have worked, um, that there were these moments, like you're saying, of someone who is willing to kind of go against what uh, many institutions have done or many teachers have done or some, something that is a different response that is built in caring and kind of adapting to a young person's situation to say, is this an opportunity to punish someone or is this an opportunity to see where they might need support? And if we can go to the next slide, um, while there's an overwhelming amount of data we have about people talking about what didn't work for them in schools, um, particularly in terms of what could have prevented their homelessness, um, there was a, a number of things that people were referencing that uh, I think could be kind of 
built into policy in different ways, but currently aren't often. Um, so this idea of support over punishment, of, of seeing signs that something might be up and seeing that as an opportunity um, to offer support or, or to have processes in place where you can connect them with organizations, connect them with, with services that are already doing work, um, rather than seeing it as a point of punishment because um, young people immediately, I think, see that as, uh, they, like people internalize that. I think that's something we also saw. Um, Mickey, maybe you could talk about this like bad seed reputation that we kept hearing from you. Uh, the bad seed reputation. Um, it seems a lot that, especially in schools, we stigmatize people. It's it's very easy when you have to not see the same I don't know, in my high school, there was 600 people, something like that. So like when you see the same 600 people over four years, you start to make a lot of judgments about them and you start to kind of categorize these judgments. Uh, these things also happen in public schools. Um, I know I know a lot of personal friends that might have talked about how a lot of their issues started in public schools by, you know, gaining the stigmas that kid who shows up not always well bathed, maybe his clothes aren't quite clean or held together very well and we often put a lot of blame instead of ask a lot of questions and so and these things and so these things follow you and it it's almost like a domino effect like once we kind of label a person as oh you're not going far oh you aren't the same worth to me as these other people it kind of seems like you're almost destined to be stuck on that path. And that's mm -hmm. something I've heard a lot of youth express to me in different ways. Um, and, it, and it can become very frustrating, actually. Uh, you, you can only have so much fight pushed at you before you start fighting back. And I think building those attitudes kind of makes it worse because once, you know, you start telling a kid, oh, you, to lash out, he's going to lash out. And so once he lashes out, we start to say, oh, see, bad seed. Yeah. He is a problem child. We, he doesn't deserve our help. When in fact, it's, I would argue it's actually quite the opposite. Absolutely. Well, and I think we also saw that people wanted to be engaged in schools. School was seen as like something that people wanted to do, whether it was for learning and like wanting to, to be in that environment or even just like, to have access to the labor market. I think almost every young person we talked to was like, I should have finished high school, or I would like to finish high school, or I'm really glad that I'm in post-secondary now, even if it's not the best environment and it's not as supportive. Um, I think another thing that came up when we were designing the interviews, which we did as a team, we were doing like a mock interview and Naomi was asking me about my educational experiences. And one of the questions she asked was, it, what would have been an intervention that would have worked? And I kind of didn't know what to say because I said, I think if anyone had come up to me and said, Jane, I, I'm here to help you, let's do something, I would have been like, no, and kind of told them to get lost. And I, I think by that point, the only thing that would have happened that would have worked, and, and this came up a lot in interviews, was if someone that I had a really strong trust with was willing to work with me at my own pace, um, and, and take time. And I think that's also something tricky because it's, it's hard to take time in, these, in, in social services, in schools. We don't have a lot of time. So I think for a lot of young people, we kept asking what would have worked. And they, they, I think, had had that label with them for so long that they said, well, nothing would have worked because I was a bad student or nothing would have worked because I didn't trust teachers. So I think finding these spaces to um, build trust so that a young person might feel okay talking about what they need. Um, and that ties into also how many times we heard that there was just one person who was willing to like do the work to intervene in a young person's lives. And often that work was just illuminating institutional processes that the young person did not have access to. So they might not know that there was an alternative education program until they end up in a shelter and they hear about it. Um, and so finding someone to navigate those systems with you when those systems aren't always clear, or maybe they're assuming that you have a parent to be doing that work, um, was seen as something that really made a difference, especially for children who were graduating or youth who were graduating, like people who weren't dropping out, who, who were getting their secondary diploma, who were maybe even going to stage up if they were in Quebec or post-secondary elsewhere. Um, having that person to help them navigate systems was like paramount. Um, 
Nikki, do you have any other thoughts on that? I I think you just worded it perfectly, and I I don't think there's anything I could add, Jane. Wonderful. Um, one thing you might have some thoughts on that was cut, has come out of the research again. Almost almost every young person we talked to, um, I would say at least three quarters, had some experience either being in a specialized classroom uh, because of a learning disability diagnosis or misdiagnosis. Um, or even a behavioral or mental health diagnosis. Um, often these classrooms were broadly serving a variety of young people, which was seen as not very useful for a lot of people, especially in primary school. Um, but often the interventions to get someone diagnosed um, were put on the family or uh, cost money. Um, and often diagnoses were uh, not the right diagnoses for a period of time, which led to a lot of educational issues. Mickey, do you have anything to add on that? Um, I do, obviously. <laughs> um, to pull another example out of my own life, I was not misdiagnosed, but heavily mismedicated for, an, for attention deficit disorder. And definitely taking what I would now as an adult understand to be a recreational dose of methylphenidate twice a day. Uh, was not good for my mental health as a child, and it it de it definitely had a lot of very negative eff effects and outcomes because of that that I've strove to overcome. Um, and it's definitely something I've heard about from a lot of other people. It often seems that either the diagnosis is very haphazardly done, oftentimes not even actually done at all, because the onus is placed so much on parents that are too often not involved in the child's life much anyways. Um, and so these problems compound and compound and compound and it, 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 it almost seems to create a snowball effect would be the word I would use for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I don't, uh, I don't think your experience is very unique either. No, no, it's, it's, and that's, and that's so much an issue. It's, it's actually very common, it seems, in our society that we just let these things just go unsolved. It's, just, it's often easier to ignore a problem than fix it, especially when there are no clear answers. Yes, it's, hard, it's overwhelming. These are overwhelming, I think, also because what we've learned in our research is that schools are one site, uh, but they're so related to everything else. So criminal justice engages in the school system and child welfare and the school system are so connected that it can seem insurmountable. Um, but I think, and I, I think the final point that I have on here, and then we can hear about other cool stuff, uh, is like passion was seen as one of the biggest factors in maintaining educational engagement. So like when young people were able to do art programming, when young people were able to learn in a way that made sense for them, um, this is something that is simple but very tricky to figure out in institutionalized education. Um, but I do think, I think, what our project will end up hopefully contributing to is we have these things from what young people have said work. Um, and I think then we just have to think about what programs can be designed to keep those in mind and make them more accessible to young people and more um, program based and not just these one off instances of teachers taking on the work or school staff and faculty taking on the work or young people supporting each other, um, that there is like this kind of response that um, can tap into work that is already being done in a meaningful way. That's all I have to say about what we're finding in our research. I'm happy to answer any questions. Mickey, if there's anything you want to add before we throw it. I actually did have one thing. Yeah. Um, I like to, when I summarize my work to some people, I often like to just boil it down to, it really seems like everything that we're doing is, is about forming community, an interconnected mm -hmm. community. And I just kind of wanted to leave everyone here today with that. It's it really is as simple as it's all about community and connecting community. Yeah, I agree. I'm glad. That's very well said, Mickey. Jane, can Thank I just I'm going off script a little. Jane and Mickey, do you have a rough timeline um, for when your research work will be available to be shared to everyone? Or is there ways that folks can stay um, you know, connected to the work? Um, yeah, I should. Uh, I'm working on my dissertation, so there should be something in the spring coming out from that. Um, but I think we have uh, 
two of the other co-researchers on the project are currently doing art um, projects based in our findings. So mm -hmm. I would say keep an eye out. I don't know, follow me on Twitter and I'll probably mm -hmm. post something once a month. <laughs> but it is very much, it's, COVID has made our analysis phase, especially as a team that works so closely together, our timeline has gotten a lot later, but I, by May, we should have some like solid reports and stuff. Great, yes, I totally appreciate the COVID impacting timelines. But in the meantime, you have something soonish. Yes, so also um, the first week of September, there will be a release of a report that I was one of the authors on that came out of the What Would It Take? Um, project like I think was 2018 from the Canadian Observatory on Homelessness. It was incredible uh, consultations with youth all over the country and it's a specific report looking at the role of the education sector in preventing uh, youth homelessness. So I'm excited for it to be out in the first week of September and uh, you should be able to access it for free through the Canadian Observatory on Homelessness. That's right and I think it might be a picture of it might be on the next slide. Hint, hint, Lindsay. <laughs> I think mean, I'll take this opportunity and P.S. I was lucky to have a sneak peek at it and uh, you know it was giving me lots of feels while I was reading it um, but also just so folks know um, we've made um, lots of references to resources or maybe we haven't explicitly throughout the presentation so far and all of the links to all of the reports and documents are available to you I think they're in the handout section and your um, little webinar control panel um, so there you go. So on that note, I think we're going to the next slide. Um, but we want to say a big thanks uh, uh, to uh, Mickey and Jane for, for telling us about all the great work that you're up to um, and are really interested to hear more. I was kind of relieved that um, a lot of what you're seeing um, and, and hearing I think aligns a lot with what we're about to talk about in terms of some of the solutions and, and the thinking behind some of the solutions or um, responses. I would have felt awful. I was like, wow, we are way missed the mark. We're totally talking about something way different. So, um, but uh, definitely, definitely some alignment there. So things um, that you touched on were definitely, you know, that ideally things should be more preventive in nature and that supports aren't um, presented to youth after they've sort of lost their housing or housing has become very um, unstable. Uh, talking about the importance of the sort of holistic needs of youth. Mickey uh, said it really well about the importance of, you know, building community. Um, addressing things like mental health concerns and disabilities and bullying. Um, and then so deeply important is having relationships built on, on trust and respect um, and having that you know, person that can sort of walk alongside, alongside you and, and help you navigate through, through school and all the other things that go along with that. So, um, so thanks so much to you both. At this point, I think Lindsay, maybe in the chat box, uh, if you haven't already, if you can share the next sort of question we have there for folks. At this point, we're really interested to know um, what folks are doing in terms of working with schools in your community, um, any sort of neat projects or programs you're engaged with. Um, and then if you're in the education sector, we'd love to hear if there's any neat collaborative uh, things you're doing with community-based organizations to support young people. And so now we're gonna switch into part three. So we're gonna look at um, the work that uh, Mary Jane or MJ as we affectionately call her um, and Jackie um, and the work that you're doing that involves uh, three sort of youth homelessness prevention projects um, that are you know strongly connected with the education sector as partners or collaborators and so the three projects we'll refer to are um, uh, the Upstream Project Canada, Youth Reconnect and Duty to Assist and we did want to acknowledge that um, these are not projects or programs that we just made up. They are definitely adapted from, from other communities, uh, including in uh, Australia, Wales, and uh, in Niagara. So we've had a really fortunate opportunity to, to learn from what other communities are doing and look at how, how these things could be adapted to sort of fit, fit our sort of Canadian or even sort of local context. So, so we're gonna get into chatting about those and some of the things that we really want to talk about are um, you know how are these projects approaching the role of the education sector and responding to youth without a stable home or at risk of homelessness 
uh, we're wanting to talk about alignment between educational outcomes for students and also outcomes we have for, for youth without a home or at risk of uh, housing loss. And then chatting a little specifically for each of the projects, what would the role of the school sort of look like, you know, when they're sort of fully implemented programs. And then we do really want to emphasize again, these are our, um, while these three projects are at different stages in terms of development and implementation, they are all generally early in the stages and we're still learning lots. Um, so bear with us a little bit. I will also caveat uh, Mickey and Jane, uh, since you guys are experts in this work, please feel free to chime in with your own thoughts um, mm -hmm. as we kind of go through the next uh, round of slides. So that's kind of the setup for this part. It's like, let's just talk about kind of the work that's happening so far. And um, I think the next slide will flip over and uh, Mary Jane wants to start us off with our sort of the first question, which was looking at how the projects are approaching the role of the education sector in youth homelessness prevention. Right, so thank you so much, Erica. Um, yeah, so you, I hope this next section is really going to reflect back on what uh, Mickey and Jane have said and also Jackie. So we're hoping that it reinforces um, all of the, the wise words that we've heard up until now and I'm feeling like there's a lot of connection here that I didn't even see before because I hadn't heard some of this, so this is fantastic. Uh, yeah, so one of the questions that, that Erica highlighted was how are these projects approaching the role of the education sector in responding to youth without a stable home or at risk of homelessness? So in this first image, um, we have um, a range of early intervention program areas. Um, and this is early intervention prevention. And I'll just, just highlight that word prevention again. We are talking about preventing and ending youth homelessness. So you can see there's a range of program areas. Um, and school-based programming is the squared one. So that's what we're talking about today. It's one among a range of program areas, uh, but they shouldn't be thought of in isolation. They're mutually reinforcing and they have the potential for integration with the system of care. Um, and as Erica had mentioned, we are still in fairly early stages with most of them. So as we, as we grow and learn, uh, these, these will become further integrated and we'll see new uh, alignments. A few key con considerations for school-based early intervention. The first one would be systems approach. So young people, as you've heard, are required to be part of the education system and spend a lot of time in schools. Schools are those key public institutions that can implement the policy, practice and programs that prevent and end homelessness. So they are a key systems um, um, prevention uh, stakeholder. Um, also in early intervention, we're working upstream. So we're talking about, again, about youth homelessness prevention, responding to youth to intervene and address those red flags that both Jackie and Mickey and Jane all talk about, talked about. So before youth fall through the cracks or and the issues turn into crisis and emergency responses. So we're really talking about moving far upstream and our approaches and our, and our resources as well. Another thing that's come up, I think, in all of the conversations today is keeping young people in their, in their communities and at school. So um, earlier we heard that almost 75% of youth, ex youth experiencing homelessness say they want to be in school. So it makes sense that we put solutions in place so they don't have to leave in the first place because disruption causes so many you know, um, downstream problems that are, are difficult to rectify. Another thing that I think we've touched on a bit, but I, I'm just going to re-emphasize. Um, so, making so meeting the educational sector outcomes. Um, a scan of provincial education acts and local school board desired outcomes reveal a surprising number of common goals between what schools want and what the youth sector are trying to, to achieve. So, education outcomes can include, as we've heard, things like specific bullying prevention and intervention. Of course, um, increased graduation rates, or they can be broader towards those mental, socio-emotional, psychological health, and that well-being piece. Um, also coming up in some of these scans and some of the, the local school board uh, strategies, they're, they're starting to emphasize, of course, every they, they differ across the country, but they are starting to emphasize that connection to families and communities. So that keeps coming up as well. So those early intervention red, red flags that we use to address um, issues naturally support those school-based outcomes that address a school, uh, sorry, student achievement. And we have the same goals, but we've been working in silos. So I think we just really want to emphasize that, that we're all trying to address similar problems and by working together, we can, we can have better outcomes for everyone. Another um, key piece that I call this the secret sauce, and I think this kind of echoes what Mickey was saying, 
in terms of community. So community school partnerships. And this is, I think, critical right now as well with COVID. Given the complex nature of the problem and the overburdened school system, we aren't saying, and we know that giving more responsibilities to educators is the solution. That's not the solution, right? So rather, we are proposing that community and other sectors support educators to address these issues and, and thereby we're reducing the burden on, on educators. So I like to call that the secret sauce, those community school partnerships. I, I am going to just bring, uh, mention COVID-19 again as well. So that has actually, in fact, increased the numbers of students um, experiencing family conflict, poverty, health struggles, trauma, and a whole ra ra range of other struggles that we are only just beginning to understand. Schools right now are overwhelmed with pandemic preparations and in need of even more support. So requ again, requiring that whole community and systems approach. I don't know if anyone wants to comment on those, but I think that's, that's I think all that's I have on. Yeah, Erica? I was going to say, MJ, that's very well said. Um, it just made me think a lot about how, you know, I think what's been touched on um, by everyone is that definitely schools are already engaging sort of in their best capacity to support yeah. youth, but, you know, could there be a way that we could support them better? Um, and I just reflect on a, an experience in my previous role answering a phone call where I worked sort of at another research organization um, and answering a phone call from a teacher locally in Hamilton who was looking for support. She had a student, she uh, knew the student was experiencing homelessness. And I just remember thinking the fact that this teacher's landed on calling a research organization looking for supports for this youth is probably a sign that something's kind of gone amiss. Um, and there needs to be something better so these teachers don't have to call research organizations <laughs> looking for new support. So, um, yeah, that's really great. Thanks for setting that up. No, well, thank you. And then uh, next slide, please, Lindsay. It's a quote because we love quotes and we like it to come from the mouths of the people who are living with this, this, this issue. So school is the perfect place to capture the risks for anything because students are there. And if they're not, you have to find out why they're not there. So that comes from a youth with lived experience in our duty to assist project, which we'll talk about soon. That's right. Maybe we can chat a little bit about the, the youth engagement there. I call these slides the, um, as the youth better say than what we just said. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So that's good. Next slide, yeah. Yep. So this, let's do a little bit of a deeper dive into, is there alignment or what is the alignment between educational outcomes um, for students um, as well as outcomes for students experiencing homelessness um, through sort of describing and examining the three projects. I feel like they need some kind of a cute name um, together. Yeah. Those are Duty to Assist, Upstream Canada, and Youth Reconnect. So maybe Jackie, MJ, and myself, we can all take turns just chatting um, about each of the little boxes here. Sure. MJ, do you want to start with duty to assist? Well, I was going to say you were going to start, but that's okay. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I, oh, I didn't follow the script. Sorry, I let no, you no. down. So I'll start with them. Um, and again, I'll reemphasize these projects are newly uh, emerging. We did not yeah. create these projects or adaptations. Um, and yeah. Just got to reiterate that. So uh, starting with Youth Reconnect, which has been up and running for uh, close to three years-ish. Um, and uh, some of the key elements about Youth Reconnect are that while it is a, um, a program that is best sort of in a community-based organization, it really is reliant on strong partnerships with schools. So um, a couple of the examples that we know locally um, well, luckily for me, in Hamilton and Niagara, pardon me, um, they're based at youth serving organizations, but they are super entwined with their local schools um, through various partnerships. Um, should clarify that it is not um, only the, the um, referrals don't only come from schools, community ride referrals can come, so there can be, youth can make self referrals, families can refer, um, themselves or other young people um, and you know community agencies schools of course um, it's 
wide open. Um, and sort of the basic definition of youth reconnect is it's very focused on outcomes and these outcomes are uh, generally ensuring that youth are connected to school, home slash family home um, and or their community. So those are ultimately the goals of the youth reconnect program and maybe just a little quick other little blurb. So youth reconnect, yes, it's early intervention. It's focusing on youth, um, you know, who have some sort of red flags indicating sort of troubles with school, family, home, community, um, and it's sort of a case management approach to working with youth to navigating them through uh, reaching their goals as it pertains to these outcomes. So I won't go into super deep detail. I, I, I will plug there is a Youth Reconnect webinar being planned for September. Um, so yeah, the, but those are the big buckets. And the guide too. There right, is a yeah. That folks can check out, which um, provides sort of, um, you know, key considerations. It's not a step by step guide to doing youth reconnect by any means, um, but it gives you kind of the, the key considerations for what youth reconnect is. And, and that should be, as I was saying earlier, with all the other links that we've provided for you all today. So who's next? Let's go upstream. Jackie, are you up? Sure. Yes. Yeah. So Upstream Canada is an adaptation of an initiative that started in Australia in a place called Geelong, where uh, they demonstrated a 40% reduction in youth homelessness. Uh, so now we are part of this international consortium uh, with Australia, Wales, and the US, looking to see how you know we can adapt this in our respective countries and scale it. Uh, right now, you know, we're in the demonstration phase, so we're working with two communities to see how we can uh, work on adapting this model to our context and to different contexts across Canada. The, the thing that is unique about Upstream Canada is that uh, it's a, there's a universal assessment as the first step to identifying uh, youth who are at risk of homelessness. So uh, the key piece to Upstream is that it's an early intervention prevention initiative. So targeting young people between the ages of 12 and 18. Uh, you know, there's a screener uh, to identify risk in different areas such as mental health, um, experiences of homelessness, um, as well as we look at strength-based areas as well, such as resiliency. Uh, and it's a collective impact model. So really emphasizing, you know, collectively planning alongside schools and the social services sector uh, to understand very school-specific context needs, um, honoring the expertise of professional professionals in the schools um, and not taking on sort of this program transfer approach, but uh, contextually adapting it as well. So um, I think it would be a really great attachment to Youth Reconnect, where we, Youth Reconnect would provide this great uh, coordinated care program, and then upstream would be sort of that element of identifying students who wouldn't otherwise be flagged um, as at risk. So we'll move on to duty to assist. Great, thank you, that's great. Uh, so, you know, we consider Youth Reconnect to be a bit of a light touch intervention and upstream, of course, there's a lot more to it in terms of planning and, and scope working more with school boards. Duty to assist, I think, is, is you know, rightly uh, an even, you know, sort of broader umbrella in some respects because it's really focusing on policy and changing legislation coordination between public systems and that responsibility among local governments. Um, so I'll just kind of um, Go into a little bit more just to explain it, but it is this is a bit of a future state thing as well. The other two we're actually working on it's in more real time. It's it's we've started to to prototype duty to assist, but it's it's in the future. The concept is based on um, the Wales Housing Act of 2014. So again, we're borrowing from from other countries, Wales. Uh, the the duty to assist assist is a statutory obligation or a legal duty. It requires local authorities to make reasonable efforts to end a person's homelessness or stabilize their housing. And it has had measurable success at reducing homelessness in Wales. So we wanted to test it to see if we could adapt it here to specifically youth homelessness in Canada. Quite simply, in a future where duty to assist is would be law in Canada, not only would local municipalities have a legal obligation to take reasonable steps to end or prevent youth homelessness, but young people would also have legal recourse 
if the housing rights had been violated. So it's a, it's a rights-based innovation that, um, that it also assists us to meet our international human rights obligations for children and youth, those conventions and treaties. Fundamentally, it marks a, a shift from where we are today. It has, I'll just briefly go into sort of some components. There's four sort of important practical ways that this works. There's a legal right to housing with implications, as I've mentioned. It involves pro those professional service providers and other meaningful adults that young people would come in contact with. There has to be a reasonable effort. So not just sending someone to an emergency shelter, it's really, uh, there has to be a real effort to, to end their homelessness in a reasonable amount of time. But all of this is really cross-jurisdictional. So it involves those big public systems integration and the change management that's required to go along with that. So duty to assist would involve all systems and governments that impact youth homelessness. But why is this a part of a webinar on the, webinar on the role of educator? educators, sorry. We worked with, um, so last summer, Erica and I actually had the privilege of working with a design for, firm, Bridgeable, uh, in the summer to simulate what it would take to develop a duty to assist for young people. Throughout the design process, we spoke with a variety of stakeholders, from, all the way from policy experts and frontline staff to young people with lived experience. All of them said that they felt there needs to be more done in schools to stop the flow of young people from entering the homelessness system. Um, in fact, they said you should start there. Uh, absolutely, all the other systems are, are important and need to be integrated, but you should start with the education system first. So we have proposed a service that does just that. It offers the support that students want while training school staff to spot the early warning signs that a young person might need. And then give staff actionable steps to fulfill their duty to assist. So it's more of a stay tuned, but you can see the elements within duty to assist both at the school level and the community level, and now this, this legal uh, obligation level and legislation fit really well within, you know, with Upstream and, and Youth Reconnect. And over the, the next while, we'll be, we'll be thinking quite deeply about how they all relate in an effective manner. So, thank you. That was a lot of fun, I have to say, last summer, uh, MJ, especially chatting with and working with the sort of, sort of a youth advisory. Um, but it was yeah. interesting, I don't know why it was such an, uh, well, what do I know? But um, it really was sort of a moment when all of the youth um, who were interviewed sort of individually mentioned and just kind of talked, I guess, in, in interviews about sort of these red flags, they didn't call them that, but things that were going on in school. So like missing class, for example, um, and sort of reflected on. But I think similar to what I'm hearing from Jane and Mickey is that they maybe in the moment didn't know what intervention would have helped them or if someone approached them, but just, I think, you know, looking in the future, they kind of reflected on like, yeah, that probably would have been a missed opportunity, or it was probably a missed opportunity for some sort of intervention to have um, to have happened. So we learned a lot through that through that work, uh, and still learning lots more based on the ongoing community engagement that we had, also pre-COVID, which has slowed down considerably. <laughs> um, well, this is it. The project's still on, and I do want to mention as well that the in your in your handout, the guiding youth home, a design-based approach to ending youth homelessness, has a lot of detail. If you're interested in more about how the a, a, a duty to assist would work in Canada for young people, so. Great. I feel like we have to give a shout out to Employment and Social Development Canada as a part of the Absolutely. Youth Employment Health Strategy. Yes. <laughs> provided funding for us to do this super rad work. Um, and uh, so kudos to you guys for uh, for making this stuff all happen. And I might also go a bit off script. I feel like Jane's got some going on over there, but I did want to check in Jane and Mickey. Like when you're hearing us talk about this stuff, like do you feel like it's a thumbs up or is it like a thumbs down or is it like, I don't know yet, I'm undecided. Not to put you on the spot, but I just did. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Mickey, do you have thoughts? I mean, I do. I think. Uh, I'm sorry. I actually had my headphones ar around my neck there for a second. I, I, I missed that, but I'll let you go. Um, I mean, for me, I think that the idea of having one policy um, that would support this kind of work and two, just like an acknowledgement of the need to work across systems and across uh, organizations, but also institutions. Like, I think it's really exciting because what we're seeing in our research is that there might be interventions happening, but they're not happening consistently. And they're definitely not happening because of policy supporting them. Um, sometimes, maybe, but like I, the idea of um, something like duty to assist, I know um, at Don Aru, we had like a presentation and we, everyone was so excited. Like, 
Um, but I think the the recognition also at schools is such an important site. Um, mm -hmm. It's so good for me to hear because I know, like, I know intimately how much of a role schools play in in could play in preventing homelessness. So um, I think, yeah, this work is really important and spot on. That's good. We passed, guys. Jane gave us. <laughs> <laughs> I think we kind of spoke to this one a little bit already. This was just so we're clear with folks where these projects um, are at. So maybe we can just briefly, you know, um, just talk about where they're at. Maybe I'll just start. Um, with U3 Connect, so just so folks are clear, so U3 Connect is currently implemented sort of under the Making the Shift demonstration project in Hamilton. Um, it's it's in its two and three quarters of a year or so running, um, and it, it's showing some really great work um, so far, and uh, we hope to see that great work continue to happen. I don't know if the other folks want to jump in and just talk about where, where things are at. Well, we're in really early stages with our communities. We're working with Kelowna, BC, and St. John's, Newfoundland, and we're looking to actually other potential communities uh, to look at uh, culturally appropriate Indigenous adaptation as well. Uh, but as I'm sure a lot of folks on this you know, webinar know, it's, it's tricky to get things passed through the school boards. So th that in itself, the ethics and, and the school board uh, requirements have have kind of lengthened the anticipated time so and with covid throwing things off uh, i think schools are increasingly seeing the need for something like this but at the same time because it's at its very early stages recognizing the need uh, for all this sort of long-term investment of planning it, it's sort of kind of stalling things a bit. So uh, we are very much still in the model development uh, stage, but a report is coming out soon on it. So stay tuned. That's great. We're leaving all these little like teasers. That's right. Breadcrumbs. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, I think, yeah, and I'm done with duty to assist. I did mention the, the timeline there and where we are with it. It's really in the conceptual stage at this point, so. Okay, that's great. Uh, Lindsay, maybe we can switch to the next slide which is another youth quote. Um, so yeah, we wanted to make sure we were, you know, sharing some of the, the um, commentary that youth shared with us through, we've been fortunate with Duty to Assist and Youth Reconnect, and I can only speak to those projects because they're the only ones I'm working on, um, to have had youth uh, input and collaboration. So, um, you know, this is just another really succinct way of a young person reiterating what we've said. They could have just said this and you didn't have to listen up battle on for all this time. Um, but this one youth who was a, a Youth Reconnect participant and, and provided um, feedback on the guide that we drafted just talked about how, quote, homelessness affects school, their education and ability to learn. School is hindered by their problems. Be there to advocate through school and to and home. Show them stability and to have someone to rely on who is always going to be there. I thought this was a nice um, comment that really captured um, some of the different points we made about, you know, the intersection between the need to have a stable home life um, to be able to um, stay, at the very least, stay engaged in, in school and to try to meet sort of educational goals um, and 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 well-being. Um, and again, with Youth Reconnect, I mean, I had the, the fortune of chatting with a bunch of youth about when we were working on this program guide, and all of them sort of touched on school, whether they were um, happy that Youth Reconnect helped them um, get back into school, they were happy to be back there, um, or if they were working on goals um, to get back there. I have this memory of sitting in a McDonald's with a youth, and a youth ran into someone that she knew, I don't know, the neighbor or whatever, and the neighbor was just so ecstatic for her to be back in school and showed this across the McDonald's. I hear you're back in school. That's great. So, um, but it really took, you know, in terms of in this particular situation, there was, you know, obviously collaboration between the Youth Reconnect sort of uh, worker and the schools to support this youth with school goals and some of the other stuff they were working on too. And I think there's one more youth quote after this one, Lindsay. Mm -hmm. Great. And then again, similar, another young person um, who really was reflecting on sort of the impact of schools um, and their experience with Youth Reconnect. And so this person said, quote, you know, a lot of 
people are on the verge of dropping out of schools, um, Youth Reconnect would be a helpful response for those youth. A lot of people hesitate to reach out for support, and the more they hesitate, they aren't going to do anything. They are ashamed of the situation. And so this kind of reminds me a lot of what um, uh, Jane and Mickey talked a little bit about. About um, I think Mickey especially was talking about the amount of stigma and judgment that young people are facing, or shame, um, or sometimes I think just not even recognizing sort of the situation they're in and that they may need support. Um, and so this made me really think about how awesome it would be to have supports available in spaces where youth are at so that, you know, when they're in a moment where maybe they're feeling um, more comfortable to reach out, those supports um, are, are right there. Um, but also so that, um, you know, teachers or professionals are equipped to know uh, when they might be suspecting that a youth might be um, having some challenges in terms of housing and whatnot, um, and might know kind of how to intervene in situations where youth, as I was saying, might not feel comfortable, um, or even recognize that they're kind of in, um, in sort of a, a challenging situation. So um, some very well said things here by the, by the young people that we've worked with. And now I think we're ready to move into, um, I mean, I think the three of us on our different projects, we're gonna talk about lessons learned, but we also welcome Jane and, and Mickey to talk about in your work so far, you know, what lessons, what are key lessons that you're learning? And I will caveat that we should probably wrap this up within four minutes. So we have at least 10 minutes for any Q&A. Um, sorry, uh, Lindsay, next slide, please. Great. So I think this is me. And yes, in the interest of time, I'll just be very brief. And please feel free to connect with me afterwards if you would like to follow up. Uh, we've drawn themes across research fields, such as implementation science, scaling social innovations, uh, change management, for example. And interestingly, they've aligned very well with what we've learned from practice, from previous soft pilots done on upstream in Ontario, uh, as well as, uh, you know, we work with our US partners very closely and we've learned from their pilots through Johns Hopkins in, in Minnesota. And just basically, I mean, it all comes down to co-planning, really understanding the school-specific context and communities, understanding what the youth's uh, needs are as well. Um, it really just comes down to the collective planning piece in terms of upstream. So that's a key lesson for us. So uh, if you are interested in implementing upstream, for example, uh, you know, everyone involved has to be sure that they're willing to collaborate. And it's it's not a conventional partnership, social, social services and education. So it's going to take a lot of groundwork, but really it's just a long-term investment in time and a deep collaboration. I think Erica and Mary Jane, you have more concrete examples. Yeah. I was gonna feel like your lessons learned are similar. Uh, I don't think anything that you are saying is important, Jackie, is something we would disagree with across all our projects. But yeah, we had a couple of things that we wanted to share. Um, one is just our sort of insight was that, you know, for folks that are uber keeners on this kind of stuff, probably your first step might be getting to know a little bit more. And I'm a bit biased, obviously, because I'm working on this project, um, is uh, looking at you free connect, check out the guide. Um, it's definitely a more adaptable and feasible kind of thing um, to start with, hoping there's some keeners listening in right now. Um, and then some other key things um, that, that I think were helpful, probably both in duty to assist, not probably, that were important both in duty to assist and youth reconnect. One is, you know, to have the um, engagement uh, of young people as sort of advisors on your on the project is so valuable and so insightful, especially in the duty to assist, because um, it was just such a interesting experience it was very busy um but i mean the youth gave us direct feedback about what they liked and didn't like when we were kind of looking at what the design of duty to assist would look like even like naming naming it um that was really really invaluable and then kind of not unrelated to that it's just finding your champions within your community like who are the folks that you know would be willing to work with you or at least share you know similar um, interests or values in, in, in approaching this work uh, this way. So, you know, in particular, who could be champions within a school system if you're in a community-based uh, organization or a youth organization um, that you can start to have conversations with about this work, um, but also, you know, more broadly in the community. So in, in the Duty to Assist project, which is, yeah, multi-system, we were mindful to try to engage with different um, 
you know, folks representing different systems and sectors uh, so that we weren't missing out. So yeah, finding champions, working with youth, um, and finding feasible things you can start with uh, if you want to engage in this work, such as looking to the possibility of youth reconnect. MJ, do you want to add anything? No, I'm fine. You covered it all. It's so, great. Okay. Look at that. Oh, Jade. <laughs> I thought you were you gonna say something or were you I feel like I saw a cat tail there. Yes, there's a cat. Um no, I don't have anything to say. I think um incorporating like lived experience and talking to youth about what makes sense for them is so integral to this work. So it's nice to hear that. We passed again. Yay! Okay, so let's jump into part four. So this is a chance to hear uh, from your uh, folks that are listening in. If you have any questions or thoughts or things you want to share, um, I think we're going to bring Lindsay back into this to let us know if, if there's anything um, to any questions. Sorry to to talk about. Yeah. Hi. <clears throat> Hello. Hello. Thank you so much for your presentations. There's lots of information to share, and obviously, you know. There's lots more to be said, or I'm sure we could fill up two hours. Um, mm -hmm. But yes, we do have some audience questions. The first question comes from Betty. Um, and Betty's question is around um, building relationships between schools and communities. So Betty asked, what are your thoughts on authentic partnerships between the school and community supports versus partnerships developed to allow the schools to continue to operate in their educate the person only box, as opposed to educating the whole person? So what does an authentic partnership actually look like? Hmm. That's a good question. I mean, I think it might start with, like I was saying, is, is finding your champions in the school system that you already kind of, um, and other folks, please jump in, folks that maybe you already sort of have a bit of a trust established with, and then just kind of building from there and seeing if they can help um, to introduce you to other other stakeholders. I know that's kind of um, when we were able to chat with folks, but again, before COVID, it was kind of word of mouth is how we um, connected with um, different folks. Um, from my experience anyway, but I don't know if other folks have uh, can can provide some input. Um, I have a thought. Um, when you I think it's on the first approach or it's that we have we have shared um, shared issues and that we have solutions for you as really focusing on it's not one more thing that schools or educators like they 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 are dealing with with it, and we have solutions and and innovations that can support their work. And really coming in with that, I think often schools feel like community is asking them to do a lot, or uh, and and really thinking about how you frame that when you're going in. You may think you're saying that, but how is it being heard by the partners within the school? Um, and and right off the bat, I think would be very helpful. Mm -hmm. I think networks too um, are shown in research to be one of the most effective things in, in mobilizing knowledge and getting people on board. So, you know, people often ask, well, how do you what steps do you even take to build these partnerships or even establish them in the first place, right? And oftentimes it's through networks, right? It could be a conversation in graduate schools. Uh, I've seen things emerge, quite genuine and, and really effective programs emerge from two educators in a graduate uh, course, just talking about their passions to support students in poverty, for example, and then they start to connect and start to connect with a nurse in the same class, for example. So I think, just that genuine desire to see change and, and finding ways to kind of build it, it really does require um, really passionate champions. Great, thank you. Does anyone else on the panel have anything to add to that before we move to the next question? Okay, great, thanks for your answers. Oh, sorry, Mickey. Oh, I was just going to I was just going to echo that last answer and just be like, yes, that's it. Um, okay, so we have another question from Betty, um, and this is a more technical question about the assessments that are used in, I guess, all, all across all three of these programs. Um, and Betty's wondering whether or not the assessments are culturally respectful. 
that's, that's a, a great question. Uh, for us, I can speak to the upstream student needs assessment. So I should say, firstly, that the assessment is not meant to be the indicator of risk. It's supposed to flag students who could potentially be at risk. And it does ask demographic for demographic information so that when these um, lists of students that are potentially at risk are sent to the point person, then the case manager will sort of understand the context, um, take that into the conversation with the student. And it's, you know, with upstream, the connection to supports is understood as the supports being very um, principled, so based on principles of being place-based, culturally appropriate, um, different ways of connecting students to the unique, their unique needs and context. So for example, connecting um, Indigenous students to friendship centers, uh, there might be a lot of different ways in which uh, the supports are provided, but it's, it's meant to be quite individualized. Uh, the assessment itself asks questions that are pretty general, but uh, for sure they're just meant, it's just meant to be um, to flag risk rather than indicate the extent to which or, or the type of risk. I hope that helps. Hmm. I, I, don't know. Know. Oh, I, yeah. say, I might just jump in and pretend I'm MJ and talk about duty to assist. And just okay. to think that with duty to assist because it's still in sort of um, design, it's not a fully, like we haven't developed a full on model or whatever, but we certainly have been mindful um, to work with a couple Indigenous partners in Hamilton where we were looking to pilot it. So, um, you know, we were, were very appreciative that they were willing to kind of help us figure this out together. Um, and then in terms of Youth Reconnect, so they do use an assessment tool there um, called the YAP. Yeah, uh, the um, tool is meant to be sort of a strength-based risk assessment of, sort of likelihood or length of homelessness. Um, in terms of its sort of cultural uh, sort of competency, I, I can't comment on that because I'm still learning about the tool, to be quite honest. Um, but I mean, it's definitely something we would want to keep keep in mind and make sure that we were, um, you know, approaching it with sort of a culturally competent lens at the very least. So I'm doing that. Okay. I'll just add, I think that's where like we have to think about it as being iterative as well and thinking about that all that planning and the relationship and the community that Nikki was speaking of and and and, and, and putting the uh, individual at the center of the process will create a process that allows for those those issues, the equity to come in place and diversity. So it's more about not being fixed on one specific way of doing things and and allowing for that broader community. Um, to, to work its magic in that sense. So, and, and we have, through duty to assist, we have used the human center design process, which does that, it puts, it centers empathy and it centers the individual. Um, so all of the tools and and uh, work that we do will be, should be imbued with that. But it, again, it's a process. So we have to have those conversations. It means bringing in some of the unusual suspects in our communities around that or people we wouldn't normally engage with. Too. So that's another opportunity for all of these projects is they allow for that deeper community engagement on all of those issues, including diversity. I should have mentioned too that beyond content, we also with upstream, the assessment can be done not in a survey format or questionnaire format, but also um, through direct interviews or focus groups. So um, that's another way in which to approach the assessment. Great. Well, thank you so much. And just looking at the time here, um, we, we unfortunately have to wrap up. But thank you so much to all of the audience who joined us here today. We have people from kind of all over North America, we have people in Halifax, Toronto, New York, California, oh. Alberta, Montreal. So it's great to see that there's a big kind of interest in this across North America. And thank you so much to all of the panelists today for sharing your insights. Um, really timely, especially with kids kind of gearing back to go back to school in September. Um, so just to remind everyone that we will be sending the PowerPoints and the recording to you via email. Um, and we'll also include the handout that yeah, some of the panelists have made reference to with links to all the resources. We'll resend that to you in case you weren't able to access it um, today through the control panel. Um, but before we take take off, yeah. is there any kind of last thoughts that uh, Erica, you or the rest of the panel yeah. have? 
Lindsay, I think there's one more very important thing. If you could flip ahead a couple of slides, that would be really excellent. <laughs> this is great. All right, you ready? Yeah. Happy birthday, Jane. <laughs> <laughs> it's Jane's birthday today, everyone. We wanted to recognize <laughs> her. Thank you so much. <laughs> presentation on her special day. Hopefully it's celebratory thing for her, but uh, thank you, Jane. It was. It was a lovely way to spend an afternoon. <laughs> That's well. great. Thanks, everyone. It's been such a blast, and we're happy to continue the conversation. As we said, this is still emerging work. We haven't got it all figured out, so stay tuned, or stay in touch. Um, yeah, and it's been really great chatting with you all panelists and working together on this, so thank you to you all. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Mickey. Take care, everyone. Take care.